Now, for things that can't get through the membrane, there is particular types of membrane transport mechanisms. And we will be examining these different types of membrane transport mechanisms. There's basically two broad categories of membrane transport. Passive processes, where no cellular energy, which remember is ATP, is required, and a substance generally moves down its concentration gradient, going from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. There's also active processes, where we must expend some energy or ATP. So passive processes can be further subdivided into diffusion or carrier mediated, and active processes are also carrier mediated or can be different types of vesicular transport. So let's look at the simplest form of passive process, simple diffusion. This is the movement of solutes through a selectively permeable membrane from an area of high solute concentration to an area of low solute concentration, where the solute is the dissolved particle in a solution, while the solvent is the substance that the solute dissolves into. And remember, water is generally our universal solvent. Simple diffusion might be an example of a fat-soluble molecule that goes directly through the phospholipid bilayer. Nonpolar lipid-soluble, which are hydrophobic substances, diffuse directly through the phospholipid bilayer. And you can see they go from an area of high concentration to low concentration. Facilitated diffusion is also known as carrier mediated. And this is where a protein carrier spe specific for one chemical allows the binding of a substrate which causes a change in the shape of the transport protein allowing the substance to get across. Certain lipophobic molecules like amino acids might use a carrier or channel. They exhibit specificity, so they're very selective for what can get across. And another important concept to note is they are saturable. The rate is determined by the number of carriers or channels. If you only have three carriers or channels, then at any one time you can only get three substances across. And the binding of the substrate causes a change in the shape of the carrier thereby allowing it to cross the membrane, as you can see in the diagram. Now, osmosis is a special type of diffusion that refers to water. It is the movement of water, the solvent, across a selectively permeable membrane. Water diffuses through the plasma membrane or lipid bilayer generally through channels called aquaporins. And water goes from an area of low solute to high solute concentration, as shown here in the diagram, or water goes from an area of high water concentration to low water concentration. So because water can freely cross the semi-permeable membrane, water, the water concentration is determined by the solute concentration. So water wants to go from the side of the beaker with low solute to high solute until the concentration of solute particles per water is equivalent on both sides of the membrane. Now, when osmosis occurs, water enters or leaves a cell. And tonicity is the ability of a solution to cause a cell to shrink 
or swell. In an isotonic solution, the solution has the same solute concentration as that of the cytosol. In a hypertonic solution, and we're talking about the solution that the cells in this diagram are being bathed in, the solution has a greater solute concentration than the cytosol. So it has a higher solute concentration, which means it has a lower water concentration. Water moves out of the cell, making it shrink and die. This is called crenation. In a hypotonic solution, again the bathing solution, the solution has less solute, a less solute concentration than that of the cytosol, so higher water, lower solute concentration, and water moves into the cell, making it swell and burst. This is known as hemolysis. Now, the passive processes that we have talked about are simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis. Now we're going to examine active transport. Active transport processes require energy. And there is two types of active transport processes that we will discuss. Primary active transport, secondary active transport, and then vesicular transport. Both use eight, or all of these use ATP to move solutes across a living plasma membrane, and generally membrane proteins are used as car um, carriers. Again, in this scenario, we are moving solutes against their concentration gradient. Now, the sodium potassium pump is primary active transport. The sodium potassium pump is located in all plasma membranes. And the sodium potassium pump is important for pumping um, sodium out of the cell and potassium into the cell. And we create a gradient, a higher concentration of sodium outside the cell than inside the cell. And this is important because we can use that gradient that we've established to then transport other things either into or out of the cell. Again, we must expend energy in order to do this. Secondary active transport depends on that ion gradient that we just established via primary active transport. And in this case, the energy stored in those ionic gradient differences can be used indirectly to drive the transport of other solutes. So primary active transport is a direct expenditure of energy. Secondary active transport is indirect. We tap into the energy gradient previously established. Co-transport allows substances to be transported, we can transport more than one substance at a time. Sometimes we can transport substances in the same direction, which is known as symport, or sometimes we can transport substances in opposite directions, which is antiport. Now, vesicular transport, there is different types. Exocytosis, we're transporting something out of a cell, exit, exocytosis, is a good way to remember that. Endocytosis, we're transporting something into the cell. Or we can transport something into, across, and then out of the cell, which is transcytosis. And vesicular transport requires cellular energy in the form of ATP. 
It often involves the formation of protein-coated vesicles. They're often receptor-mediated and very selective. Endocytosis has three different types, phagocytosis, penocytosis, and receptor-mediated cytosis. Phagocytosis is where cells generally engulf large particles or solids and bring them into the cell's interior. Our macrophage and some white blood cells use phagocytosis, as you will see throughout your study of anatomy and physiology. Fluid-filled endocytosis is called penocytosis. The plasma membrane enfolds, bringing extracellular fluid and solutes into the interior of the cell. Nutrient absorption in the small intestine is an example of this. And receptor-mediated endocytosis is where we have these pits that have been coated and they provide the main route for endocytosis. When we take up enzymes or low-density lipoproteins, insulin, those are all examples of this form of endocytosis. Exocytosis is much like endocytosis in reverse. And this is where a vesicle fuses with the plasma membrane and the contents are released into the extracellular fluid. Examples of this in our cells are hormone secretion, neuro neurotransmitter release, or just when we want to get rid of metabolic waste products. So the active processes that we have talked about are primary active transport, secondary active transport, exocytosis, and then phagocytosis, penocytosis, and receptor-mediated endocytosis.